arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a separate stabbing on a train in the capital. Footage of that incident shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife as passengers called for help. Meanwhile, British Transport Police are enhancing patrols over the Easter weekend, they say, across a number of stations in London following both those unconnected stabbings on the rail network. Michael Gove today described the management of Thames Water an absolute disgrace after calls to increase customers' bills to plug their funding hole. The firm's bosses have admitted it could face the risk of emergency nationalisation as its cash crisis deepens. Shareholders have refused to give the company half a billion pounds of extra financing, describing their rescue plan laid out to them as uninvestable. Instead, shareholders have said they want the regulator off what to increase customers' bills by up to 40% over the next five years. Mr Gove says Thames Water has behaved in an arrogant way towards its customers and must take responsibility for its failings. For years now, uh, we've seen uh, the customers of Thames Water taken advantage of by successive management teams that have been taking out profits and not investing as they should have been. So the answer is not to hit the consumers. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And of course, the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. The Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, has been talking to us here at GB News today, saying that Labour will get the levelling up agenda back on track. Speaking shortly after an event in the West Midlands to launch the local election campaign for the party, the Labour leader dismissed suggestions that even Boris Johnson might be given a role in reviving the policy. Levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality, um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. Um, but I intend to make sure that um, every area, whether it's Dudley where we are now or anywhere across the country, feels the benefit of a growing economy. Sakir Starmer speaking to GB News earlier. Now, the United Nations is calling on Rishi Sunak to scrap his Rwanda scheme. The organisation's Human Rights Committee says the government's plan to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to the East African nation should be abandoned or repealed if it passes in Parliament. In a report, 18 member states raised concerns of discrimination and potential violations of international law. But the government has responded, accusing the UN itself of double standards because, they say, it already sends refugees to Rwanda itself. Over 600 Border Force officers at Heathrow Airport are set to go on strike for four days, starting from the 11th of April. In a recent vote, 90% of union members at the UK's busiest airport backed the walkout over new shift pattern changes. The PCS union suggests the changes could see as many as 250 staff pushed out of their jobs. So they're demanding for plans to be withdrawn, calling it unprofessional and even inhumane treatment of staff that are, they say, critical to national security. A man has been arrested in connection with the death of the Gogglebox star, George Gilby, who died yesterday after a fall at work. He was best known for appearing on the Channel 4 television series, which takes people inside viewers' homes whilst they're watching television. He also appeared on Celebrity Big Brother in 2014. Essex police have detained a man in his 40s on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. In the United States, an entrepreneur and founder of a cryptocurrency exchange has been sentenced to 25 years behind bars for multi-million dollar fraud. Sam Bankman-Fried's firm, FTX, was valued at $32 billion before it went bankrupt in 2022. The 32-year-old's been convicted of stealing US$8 billion US dollars from his customers. His sentencing today marks a dramatic downfall for the former billionaire who was once a major political donor. In news here at home, plans to reform Britain's leasehold property laws have been criticised by peers who say the bill doesn't go far enough. Leaseholds allow homeowners to buy and live in a property for a set number of years while paying charges for the land. 
However, there's been mounting criticism of the system, with many residents seeing charges rise dramatically, often with little explanation, meaning homeowners can often be locked into costly contracts with little right to redress. And the government has dropped its pledge to scrap leaseholds last year. Labour's housing spokesperson, Baroness Taylor, called the government's current proposal a shell of a bill that won't offer the security that homeowners are asking for. And lastly, the British filmmaker Christopher Nolan and his wife, producer Emma Thomas, are respectively to receive a knighthood and a damehood. Their film Oppenheimer took home the best Oscar for the Oscar rather for Best Picture at this year's Academy Awards. And together they've created some of Hollywood's most celebrated cinema, including Dunkirk, Inception, and the trilogy of Batman film starring Christian Bale. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thanks very much for that. Polly, I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me in my panel, I've got the Conservative parliamentary candidate for Finchley and Golders Green, that's a mouthful, Alex Dean, uh, and the director of the charity World Right, Kerry Dingle. Good evening to both Good of evening you. To you. That's a slight change of title for you. Thank you very much. Proudly selected. Well, I can tell you, uh, we will be talking politics in just a couple of minutes. Labour today, they want to talk all about levelling up. The Tories want to talk all about Angela Rayner. We'll get into all of that and lots more tonight. Do you feel like, um, I, I don't know how best to explain it, almost like I, I feel like the fabric of society, the foundation of society, seems to be getting absolutely smashed at the moment. Uh, I want to talk to you about crime and law and order and what on earth do we do to try and restore some of it and also what is causing some of the disharmony, uh, the disruption and some of the devastation that's happening among our communities. Your thoughts on all of that, so I'll get through it all and more. GBviews at gbnews.com is how you email me tonight or you can can tweet me at GB News. But of course, Keir Starmer, um, off he goes today. Uh, the launch of their local election campaign and our political editor, Christopher Herb, was there to talk to him. Let's listen to some of the things he had to say. You levelling up at, you've announced that in Dudley, Boris Johnson's idea. Um, would you give him a job in a Labour government? Have you got an interesting appointment for you? No. Definitely not. Definitely not. And I'll tell you for why, because levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. See, this whole notion of levelling up, and we go around the houses with it, don't we? Um, but I must confess, Alex, I don't think any political party is serious about levelling up. Um, because if they were, I don't believe we would have such a kind of void, uh, a difference, sorry, between, uh, let's just say, the North and... I almost want to say the South, but really what we mean is London. Because yeah. that difference, um, that separation, wouldn't have been allowed to uh, get deeper and deeper over the decades like it has, if anyone truly cared. There's plenty of rural poverty in the English South. The uh, southwest has many uh, patches of it. Indeed, even East Anglia, uh, where I hail from originally, um, has uh, uh, has some. There are pockets of, of real deprivation in London, famously. But there is no doubt that London is the economic centre and powerhouse of our, our country and effectively economic activity fans out from uh, London and has done for several generations. But I don't accept your premise that government doesn't take it seriously. Governments of all stripes, uh, Labour, Coalition and Conservative, have tried to do something about it. Think of the hiving out of things like you know, the, the passport agency and the DVLA, bits, discrete ETE bits of government that they can put somewhere else, or the creation of regional mayors and metro mayors and so forth. One can say that you didn't think each of these were good ideas or not, but collectively they demonstrate governments have been trying to foster economic activity in different areas. London is, London is stubbornly and persistently, you know, where people want to be and the um, economic centre of our, our country. But I think trying to level up is a good thing, as now the Labour Party taking a Conservative Party policy shows. I'll come back to you uh, with some feedback on that, but uh, Kerry, where are you on it? Um, maybe I'm a bit more, more, more jaded than Alex because it does seem to me that it's all talk and there's very little action. And even Keir Starmer taking Boris Johnson's idea or, or whatever, wh what does it actually entail? You know, you, you hear what he has to say, but 
where's the policy? Where's the policies? You know, is he talking about massive house building in the north, massive uh, investment in new industries or energy in the north? No, we're not having any of it. So I just don't see what it means. And all that I'm afraid that, that Sunak has done is, again, more talk. We know that even in Dudley, where Keir launched his thing today, there's been things like, you know, promised le leisure centre, promised new bus station, but they haven't actually materialised. And transport is key. Because when you, um, obviously, we're sitting in London and yeah. the transport links here are just, I mean, when they work, they're, they're second to none. But you mm. try and get from east to west or you're trying to go from uh, wherever it could be, the transport is just not there. Yeah, a few things on that. First of all, I thought that actually the, um, the public case for HS3, the connective east-west route, was probably stronger than the case for the north-west uh, HS2. Uh, and uh, politically, I probably would have done them the other way round. I would have gone for HS3 first, where there was more kind of universal support. But secondly, let's be honest about what's made HS2 so difficult. In part, it's because everyone insisted they didn't want to see it, and they wanted to dig up and then cover over what most people don't, aren't that bothered by, which is sight of a train line. Ask the French where they see their te TGVs going whizzing through, or the HS1, the Euro star go flying past them. They don't mind seeing it. But there was so much resistance from community after community and so many politicians willing on all sides uh, to give way to that uh, tendency that we have quadrupled, quintupled yeah, the would cost you want, of it by putting it underneath. Would you want a, a juggernaut of a train like zipping through your community, your hillside? I've spent a good amount of time in northern France where HS1, now called the Eurostar, goes past, and then there are plenty of people who live in Kent with uh, the HS1 route. And it's actually not an unattractive thing. So, so give you a straight answer, yes, I would. Would you? Would you at home want a high-speed uh, rail going through your uh, community, your village, your, your hillside, wherever? I wouldn't. Uh, Kerry? Uh, well, when I grew up, there was a train line went through the bottom of the field from our garden, and it, I just used to hide because it was terrifying. But in general, I, I'm, a, I'm pro the need for speed and for better infrastructure in whatever form it takes. I, what I would say, though, that on this Keir's proposal seems to be mainly that he's going to hand devolve more power. You know, mm, he's going to hand yep. more power, power to local councils. But isn't Birmingham City Council bust? bankrupt. Yeah. And what does hand more power mean if there's no investment? So, I, uh, the two troubles for me are that many local authorities don't use the powers they already have. Uh, and then the second issue, which is, again, not a party political one, because it's happened under governments of, of both stripes, is that we don't fund local government to do what they've got responsibility for already. So, if you just consider their responsibility for social care and the increasingly elderly and dependent on state population that we have, if you just took social care, many more councils will go bust on current uh, timelines, because because they can't afford to care for the residents that they've got and are going to have. So we've systematically underfunded local government. It's a very unfashionable point because all of the political parties have loved to centralise uh, control in Westminster. I'm all for letting uh, local governments control things, but you've got to give them the money to do it. Mm. So many of you have got in touch about this devolution um, scenario. John says, Michelle, we need less devolution, not more. Uh, you don't need any of it to enable levelling up. You just need a competent department to administer it. Uh, Andy says, I'm not sure that anyone even knew what levelling up meant. It's one of those terms that people say, uh, but can you even explain what it actually means. How would you define levelling up, Alex? So there are economically uh, highly successful regions of the country and there are some areas which uh, significantly need help in infrastructure and um, transport support uh, and other things too, but let's take those first, uh, to level them up. Rather than levelling down a community by taxing it more and saying you want less spending in, say, London, you want those other communities to see increased and improved economic activity and job uh, opportunities. How would you define levelling up, Kerry? Well, I don't. I think I think Alex is right on that. But what worries me is a kind of share out the misery approach. And when you know, if there isn't the funding, then what are we talking about? And I haven't seen from either um, Sunak or Starmer a properly pro growth agenda, mm. which could change things. And yeah. so, what we're we talking about here is it's all. 
hot air. Well, the, the case for economic stimulus by dint of tax cuts and, uh, and so forth got rather lost in the uh, coronavirus and post-coronavirus period. So I, I accept that premise to a degree. But it's just remarkable lack of imagination, to my mind, for um, the leader of the opposition to say, my, po my policy is that which the government said last, but I just think I'd do it a bit better. Um, you see, I, I would it's simplify it to me, levelling up means that somebody like me uh, that's from the north, you don't have to choose... Do I want to stay in my hometown and be with my family yeah. or do I want to develop my career? You're able to develop your career, however you want to, in and around the area in which you live. Once you achieve that, then for yeah. me, you've, you've sorted that's it. That's nice. And I'm definitely up for economic regeneration in parts of the country that have uh, not seen uh, success in the same way that London has, in, ter in terms of economic activity, at least. There are lots of things wrong with London, but in terms of economic activity, that's unarguable. But it's very easy for anyone in politics to agree with what you just said, Michelle. I'm not sure I do, actually. In America, America, people often move states for jobs. They go to the other side of the country because they find the, the opportunity they want. We have constituencies next door to each other in the UK, with one with full employment and one with high rates of unemployment. People in the UK won't move down the road for a job. So I'm not sure I, I pander to this. See, it's very easy for me to agree with you, but I'm I not sure I do. I don't mind moving around by choice to develop and advance my career, but I absolutely resent having to leave my hometown in order to get anything kind sure. of like a decent job because literally there are none where I, we're from. I, I just want to say, in this letter, this yeah. article thing that uh, Starmer and Rayner have written, written in The Times, they talk about, like, levelling up in the city. It's not just about the big cities. Uh, places like Workington and Hartlepool once had thriving local economies specialising in steel and shipbuilding. Uh, yeah. this, she goes on about they were, na they were vital to the national economy. Um, with a different approach, with focus on infrastructure and strategy, we can drive town uh, growth in towns as well as cities. But I look at this I think, what are you even talking about? Because those wow. industries were decimated decades ago. We've had multiple uh, governments since then, uh, some of them Labour. Nobody cares. But one of the things I found interesting today, uh, that Labour are going on about growth and um, the economy and all the rest of it, the Tories seem to be focusing in on Angela Rayner's capital gains tax and her, um, you know, whether she de declared her address rightly or wrongly when she was uh, trying to get elected. Why? Yeah. Well, I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask someone who wants to c have control over housing and taxation policy whether they got their housing and tax uh, rules right when they last sold a house. I think that's fair. But I, I want to step back and say, I mean, this, this letter that they've written together, so, so sweetly pretending that Starmer and Rayner are on the same page on stuff. Remember, he once tried to demote her and wound up sort of promoting her after a disappointing set of local election might even have been the last time the seats we're about to see contested um, come up. So things yeah, come... Yeah, but maybe they've circle. got a united but, front now and they put it all behind yeah, that, them and they're going forward th that's on nice, the same page. You were saying that you were disappointed because you you weren't seeing what local government lo levelling up meant to you. Do you know who should be really disappointed with this? It's real left-wingers. It's socialists who say, I want my uh, leadership to say, you know, we would tax the rich more, uh, more uh, distribution of wealth. And there's no real sense of the actual left-wing here. I think if you were genuinely on the left, you'd be very disappointed with this. Yeah, I just think too many towns and cities were failed when their core industries were absolutely decimated because no one cared, no one cared. You had uh, employers that had employed the granddads, the dads, the sons, whole generations of families and they got removed and all of the supply chains, all of the kind of ecosystem that went with it just absolutely destroyed and those towns and cities, they've never recovered. Michelle, the biggest example of that were the coal mines. You've got a son, would you want him to go down the pits? Would I want him to go down the pits in today's day and age? No, because uh, society and technology and everything has moved on. But in those day and ages, in those day and ages, if that was the core um, employer, if you remove that, you then have to be responsible for thinking, applying brain cells, and coming up with alternate or helping to come up with alternate employment opportunities. You can't just remove, for example, a coal mine or a shipbuilding or a steelworks and then just leave people. Well, no, well they have. And I, no, I think you're absolutely right. You know, 20,000 jobs went in '84 um, uh, with the defeat of the miners' strike. And in truth, there was no, you know, the Conservatives were very clear they were going to shut this down. Now everybody looks back and revises their thinking on this and said, oh, somehow Margaret Thatcher was a green, which is hilarious. But the, in truth, uh, you're completely right about the devastation of industry in the North. And no, you know, they did just decimate jobs and never think about 
putting forward an alternative and where people are going to work. And now, if we look at what Starmer's got on offer and Angela Rayner, what are they talking other than green jobs? Well, that doesn't mean shipbuilding or even decent infrastructure or home building. What does it mean? Well, I don't know. What does it mean? How have you interpreted it at home? And how much faith do you have in politicians to actually fix some of these issues going forward? I'll bring you into the conversation after the break, but I also want to speak to you about the absolute state of society and some of the goings on now when it comes to crime and law and order. What on earth's going on? What's behind it? And how, crucially, do we even begin to think about fixing it? You tell me. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. It's the first time we've had an admission from someone who at least used to be very senior yep. in the party, saying that this election is not about winning, really, for the Conservatives now, it's about mitigating the losses. There is broad recognition that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the next election. I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously, maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they'd promised, I can't imagine that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Jubri and I'm with you till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me remain Alex Dean and Kerry Dingle. Welcome back, everybody. Um, lots of people getting in touch about this whole notion of levelling up. Do we need it? What does it even mean? And crucially, will anyone actually really ever achieve it? Uh, Terry in Birmingham says, to me, levelling up means any money spent around the country is equal rather than the lying, lion's share of spending goes to London. Ultimately, he says, we all pay the same taxes. People in, uh, in and around London, they would argue that actually the cost of everything uh, in London is so much more expensive. Uh, one of my viewers, I've just lost your name, you say that actually uh, you wish a big wall could be built around the M25 and everyone in it could just have everything that they want to leave everyone else alone. But what would you do about the loss of taxes then? Because don't forget, of course, uh, London does indeed generate a lot of taxes. Emily uh, says, Michelle, I'm watching your show from Germany, but I am from Grimsby. Uh, she says, North East Lincolnshire, yes, I know it well. 
Uh, she says, like you, Michelle, um, I had to, after university, leave, and she had to go and find a, a career overseas to get a, a better job with prospects. How do you feel about that, Emily? Are you fine with that? Or do you feel a little bit resentful that you had to choose between your home, your family, and your career? Tell me. Uh, let's talk, though, shall we? Crime, because... You might have seen over the last 48 hours, there have been some horrendous um, knife attacks that centred around uh, train stations and indeed trains. You will have seen perhaps some of the videos. I know we showed at least one of them on here. I've got to say, though, now arrests have been made in both of these situations, so I can't get into the specifics now of those cases because of those uh, legal scenarios now. But I want to talk broadly about the absolute state of society at the moment because it certainly feels like things have really changed in recent years. It seems that people are getting more angry, uh, more aggressive. It feels like they seem to be getting more violent. There's a 78% increase in crimes uh, involving knives as well over the next 10 years. Over the last, over ten, the last, last 10 years. Time. Yeah, gosh, hopefully it won't be getting worse over the next 10 years, but unfortunately I suspect it will be. Uh, what do you think is to blame for this, Alex? Well, there's a small group of people in society who commit most of the crimes, and that's been true for a very uh, long time. Um, the, it, it, you, you find repeat offending uh, as a big feature in British uh, criminal annals 100 years ago. So that aspect of, of, of British life hasn't changed uh, that much. And part of the reason that you get stats like this, unfashionable answer, is that uh, you get more reporting of things, including people being stopped and searched, and that you find that there's a knife there. So that accounts for part of the uh, rise in the stats. But the reason it feels so different, I think, beyond the statistics, is that people aren't... There are knives and knives. And that some of the things people are carrying around, these so-called zombie knives, mm. are truly terrifying sort of short sword to not that short sword uh, sort of territory. And that, I think, is the, the biggest change, what people are taking with them. People have always... I mean, there's this euphemism in the criminal law of bladed article, uh, which has been used so that people can't get away with something that isn't a knife but has an edge to it uh, be taken as a weapon with them. But these things are unambiguously only for one thing. Those zombie knives are just to do harm for other, to other people. That's their purpose. I'll come back to you in a second, but Kerry, your thoughts? Um, I, don't think that, I don't think that's quite right, Alex. I mean, what you're saying is wrong. It's just that it's not looking at the specifics of now. And I do think there's been a shift over the last decade, maybe slightly longer, in terms of how we see our fellow human beings. I think we live in quite profoundly anti-human times where we often see human beings, and we teach this to young people, as a scourge on the planet. We have developed a real victim culture where, you know, young men think they've, that society has, you know, done terrible things to them. And that can lead itself to a kind of grievance culture where you think it's OK, you know, I've... Society has done this to me, I'm getting my own back. And also a very narcissistic individualism, which means somebody's nasty to you on social media and you think it's all right to stab them. I mean, those things where we've bigged up people's mm. individual self-worth, self-esteem, all this kind of uh, therapy culture. And I think it had... This might be too abstract or too philosophical, but there is something broader underneath going on, which means we do not respect our fellow human beings and we think it's OK to commit a public act of stabbing. But, you see, I don't think people care. So people are doing it now, like, I, I can't... I desperately want to get into the videos that I saw, you know what I mean, but I can't really. But people are, people are in broad daylight... They don't care who's watching. Yeah. They don't care who's around. Whether that's as simple as they're emptying their, the, you know, their supermarket shelves into carrier bags, and they don't care who's watching. Yes, whether I hate it's that knifing too. people, yeah. nicking stuff, they, they're not bothered. Yeah, I, but I it hate... is performative. I think you're right. I think it's deliberately public. You know, it's not just they don't care that it's public; it's willfully public, and I think that's shocking. Yeah. So I, I hate that kind of behaviour too. But it is. Look, there is always. There's no shortage of people willing to say society's gone to the dogs and there's usually uh, some reward for it. But there is another side to the coin. British people, I think, are nicer and kinder and gentler than your news uh, headlines... I don't mean yours, GB News, than, than um, people's news headlines might suggest. And I'll give you an example that I think demonstrates that. We're about to have uh, local elections and then at some point, probably almost certainly this year, we're going to have general elections. 
Compare our politics to most people's. Our politicians are still more open, more accessible, uh, more um, uh, willing to have conversations with, uh, rightly willing to have conversations with their electors than most. What's that got to do with the price of fish? Well, we're talking to... about crime. I, I, you put, the, the point that was being put to me was that society was increasingly atomised and that mm. people were atavistic and selfish and didn't care about their fellow man and woman. And I right. don't think that's true. Uh, and and the, one of the symptoms of that was knife crime. And I don't accept that premise. I think that... If if you look at how grassroots politics happens in this country, people are, um, you know, the events are open, they are um, polite. People are much more polite in person than they are online. Uh, and people, generally speaking, care about their communities, not just about themselves. Yeah, but there's a you, uh, and that's great. If everyone's nice and all those nice people and everyone's talking to each other, wonderful. But I want to drill down on the flip side of that coin, where people are walking around thinking that they can terrorise other people, whether yeah. it's their neighbours, whether it's shopkeepers, whether it's uh, commuters I... on the train. And the Tories, one of the, one of the key tenets of what was supposed to divide the Tories and whoever else, was law and order. Yeah, I agree, that is a tenet of the Conservative Party. But I would say... Um... That the reason I was dwelling on repeats crime is that most people do not behave like that. Indeed, most people share your horror at that. What we do have to do is get the punishment part right. Part of the problem isn't just longer sentences or, or, or that kind of discussion. Part of the problem is these people don't think they'll get caught, right? And if you don't think you're going to ever face the ramifications of... Well, that's this is my point. If you don't think you're going to face any ramifications for your activity, then what the sentence might be if you do doesn't actually matter. So, uh, for me, I, I certainly want to have more police on the streets. I want uh, better uh, funding and support for law and order in British society. But please, let's not pretend. Let's not imagine that suddenly everyone in Britain behaves like this. Most people watching this at home, most people on the streets in the United Kingdom, are as horrified as you are. Tell me, um, uh, you guys watching at home, your areas where you live, do you think that things are changing? Do you feel safe where you live? If you had uh, a matter of crime that involved you or a loved one or whatever, do you actually have uh, faith and confidence that someone would come out and help you, whether that's um, the authorities, whether it's your fellow uh, neighbours or community or whatever? Uh, tell me your sentiment on that. I just want to uh, make something clear as well, because this is not just a London thing, I have to stress. The rates of knife crime by police Area. So if you look at this pair, 100,000 uh, population, West Midlands ranked number one. That was the police force area uh, that ranked number one for knife crime. Cleveland second, Met Police uh, third, South Yorkshire fourth, and Greater Manchester fifth. Um, see, I just... Uh, I feel like... People will come out, and I know you do a lot of work with young people, and after the break, I want to bring in uh, the attitudes of going on at school and in the homes and all the rest of it, because teachers now are saying that, actually, the young. But so many people will turn around, Kerry, and they'll go, oh, yeah, this is because you haven't got no youth clubs. People are going around macheting in each other because you've taken the ping-pong tables away. What do you think to that? I just think it's a complete nonsense. and uh, It's very tragic that that's what people will come out with. They'll say... Uh, they will say there's insufficient police. Um, it might be true in some areas in terms of physical presence, and they'll say it's lack of youth clubs or it's material deprivation. So if you're poor, you stab people. What a load of rubbish. I mean, some people who commit these uh, kind of atrocities are, you know, materially quite well off and, and flourishing, so I don't accept that, which is why I would go back to... And I, I, it is a minority, Alex. I'm not saying... You know, all of society is full of narcissistic murderers or anything like that. Yeah. But there is a grievance culture. It is real. There is an entitlement culture which says, I've been, you know, done unto and therefore you deserve this. Yes. So there is those, those phenomena which allow for especially young men, to do and, and get away, it seems, um, with some of these horrific acts. Yes. And there is a failure of authority more broadly to stand up to them. And I think one of the problems that we've got is, uh, you know, we can have another debate about, you know, the, the priorities of the police and what they're doing, because I think that, that leaves a lot to be desired when they're off chasing somebody for their tweet rather than this kind of uh, crime. But there is... We also know that where you're... If you're a shopkeeper or you're someone in a local community and you stood up... I know when I've stood up against kids who are, are talking rubbish or being quite vile, you get, I'm going to report you. Yes, I, I, under, I understand. And that the householder who clocks the burglar has a non-trivial concern that he himself might be prosecuted. Part of the trouble, you're, you're right, is that 
a generation has never heard no. A generation has never been told you can't do something. I, I accept that. But there is also a problem about identity and people. You know, we used to say that you don't judge people by the content of their, but you judge people by the content of their character, not the colour of their skin. And this is the first generation being told that's not the case. That you do forever judge people by their background. Mm. And if you grew up poor, then that's forever an excuse to behave in any way that you like. And if you are this colour or that colour, then you can never escape your background. You'll always be judged by it, and that's the box you belong in. Well, if that's what we tell people, then uh, then what I do isn't actually to do with me. It's mm. to do with the identity that I've, I've got. It's not my responsibility that I behave badly. I behave badly because of the disadvantages I've been given in society. That's and you're the people that told me that was the case. That's a very good point. We'll continue this conversation after the break. You know, teachers now are saying as well that kids, some of them are like as young as three and four, spitting, swearing, teachers getting abused and assaulted. What's going on? What is the root of this? Tell me your thoughts. I'll see you in two. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There will still be some showers around this weekend, but generally through the Easter period, it is going to be a bit drier and a bit warmer than it has been of late. Low pressure still in control like it has been through much of this week, but the flow around the low is going to ease a little bit, so we will see our winds easing. That being said, through the end of today, still quite blustery for many of us, some heavy showery rain affecting northern areas, something a little bit drier and clearer across central parts and also Northern Ireland here under the clear skies could see a touch of frost and perhaps even a few pockets of mist and fog. Elsewhere, where we stick with the cloud and the showery rain, it is going to be a milder start to Good Friday. Otherwise, and as we go through Good Friday itself, yes, a bit of brightness and some dry weather around at first, but still outbreaks of showery rain and a greater chance of catching some showers as we go into the afternoon. Potential for some showers turning heavy, possibly even thundery with some hail. But there should be some bright sunny spells in between the showers and temperatures higher than recently, highs of around 14 Celsius towards the southeast. The winds will be easing and easing further as we go into Saturday, which does look like it will be a calmer and drier day than of late for many. Still some showers around, but they don't look quite as intense as we've seen recently, though potential for some heavy rain to affect parts of Cornwall later on in the day. Easter day itself on Sunday looks mostly dry. There are a few showers still, but turning cooler again by Monday. See you later. The latest GB News travel. Good evening, my name is Johnny Ratner. Big problems continue for the M42 in Worcestershire this evening. The southbound carriageway of the motorway is blocked to junction free the Redditch turnoff at the scene of an accident. That's causing queues back to four at the Shirley and Dorridge turnoff and back along the M40 as well heading north. And the M487 bridge remains closed both ways between England and Wales because of the strong winds. That's causing long queues as you head into Wales over the Prince of Wales Bridge, the M4 and the M49 and the M5 in the area very slow northwest of Bristol as a result. And in Dorset, just west of Dorchester, near to Kingston Russell, the A35 is shut westbound after a caravan overturned. Sandbanks ferries remain suspended to Dublin to Pool, and other travel can't run the ride to South Sea stretch because of bad weather. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, Michelle Jubilee, Tull 7, Conservative candidate for Finchley and Golders Green. Alex Dean alongside me as is the director of the charity World Right, Kerry Dingle. Welcome back, everyone. We're just talking about crime. Um, John says, Michelle, drugs and social media, in his mind, are the biggest drivers of all crime. Rebecca says, Michelle, all of this stuff about doing crime in broad daylight is simple. It's because we do not have any police anywhere. Rob says the UK is an angry place. It's lacking equality. We've got a big wealth gap, high taxes, lawlessness, for everything and anything when you mix it all together what do you expect 
other than many violent people. Um, there you go. Glenn says, I'm a born and bred Lunder and I had to move out because no way, he says, was I going to bring a family up in that place at all. Although he does say he commutes uh, into London for work and escapes at the end of the day. Uh, you mentioned social media, John. I remember when I had an incident um, on a train, we discussed it on this uh, programme, someone who I described as a madman threatening all of the passengers and we were terrified. And then I was taken to task, you remember this, by a Labour councillor who said that I was uh, wrong to describe the perpetrator as a madman because actually um, it was playing into stereotypes for the perpetrators. And this is one of the things I think we've got wrong in society. We focus more on offending criminals yeah. than what we actually do, helping people that are victims of crime. Before I work out, uh, yeah, before I complain about you stabbing me, can you let me know what your pronouns are? Exactly. Anyway, it'd be fair to that lady. You might remember it. She came on the show, do you remember? Anyway, I do just want to bring up a case because it, speaking of crime, I, thought, I find it quite upsetting actually. Uh, police officers, they are trying now, they're appealing for the public's help, so I want you all to uh, get your eyes peeled, particularly if you're anywhere near Hackney. Uh, a van has been stolen. This is the registration uh, plate. It's a, it's a Ford Transit van. Uh, it's grey. Uh, the registration plate is B. Uh, I'm going to go all um, thingy. Bravo Golf 72 Whiskey Bravo Tango. Now, this is not any uh, normal van. This is a little boy's uh, van. He's terminally ill, uh, and this is what he's family uh, used to help uh, transport him around. Uh, his mum says, I'm appealing to everyone to keep an eye out. Uh, this is not just a vehicle, it's a lifeline. It's our road to freedom. Without it, our poor boy cannot see in his final days. Every day is an extension of his life, she says, and we thank God for them. Uh, but they need that vehicle back. Keep your eyes peeled. I just think people are just scum. Sorry, I probably shouldn't be using those phrases, but I just think, who, who sits there steals a van, realises it's got some uh, medical stuff in it and get, keeps it dry. Who does that? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't imagine they, they knew that that was the case. And I'm not yeah, making excuses. You'd soon realise, Alex, you'd yeah, soon realise. That, that's true, but I, they then, uh, assuming that they would get caught if they took it back, just dumped it, as I imagine what happened. Well, just happened. dump it and ring the police then and tell them where yeah. it is. I, I, I follow. Anyway, I'll get off my high horse. One in five teachers have apparently been hit by pupils this year. Apparently, uh, kids at school, uh, their behaviour is getting worse and worse and worse. Many teachers are saying it's since uh, COVID. Parents, apparently, uh, less tolerant and they've lost respect for school rules. What do you think is going on, Alex? So both my um, parents were teachers and it's a profession I greatly uh, respect. And in another life, I might have gone into it myself. Um, Tony Blair was the master of talking about this because he presided over a large part of this cultural change. But nevertheless, what he said to Michael Howard over the dispatch box was this. When you and I were at school, if you got in trouble at school, you got in trouble at home. And that's not mm. true anymore. I right? think and that's... There, Blair was... Because he was, it was happening on Blair's watch, basically. But he, he was still... There is a real truth in that. And if anything, it's got worse. Parents fear, not only if they tell the child that they're wrong, the child's going to kick off. They feel they fear that instead of the parent backing them up, the parent's going to come in and complain about them or even worse. So it's not just the child you've got to be concerned about, it's the parent too. And I think that's a dreadful state of affairs. Kerry? I do think too much is being... Uh, I think COVID was a problem in people have lost the respect for education, given that, you know, teachers and teaching unions said, oh, we, you know, shut them down and kept calling for even greater school closures and that learning from home was fine, which it clearly isn't. And there are now thousands of kids learning from. So I think education's lost some of its kudos. And, uh, but I think there is something more problematic and that is loss of teachers' authority and politicians expecting schools to make up for social ills. So we've entirely instrumentalised education. It's yeah. supposed to now cure all social ills. But Teachers now have to do, you know, all this, you know, everything from teaching net zero to, to pronouns to critical race theory, you name it, instead of passing on the best of what is known in terms of knowledge, which is what we need them to do... Sure. Um, when they are given this huge thing to do and are also terrified of being disciplinarian, and we've seen that with uh, Catherine Burble Singh and the Michaela mm -hmm. School, um, where discipline comes in and you lay a real foundation for kids to be independent and to think critically by being respectful and having greater communication, when that breaks down, you know, I don't see what kids are leaving school with. And it's a vicious circle. 
you know, the more you have a breakdown in authority, the more you have a breakdown in discipline, the less kids go to school, the less they care about education, the more disrespectful well, and so on. But Michelle, you were asking us why it's happening and you got one answer from Kerry about COVID. Uh, let me try uh, another one which I think runs rather deeper. People, uh, on the one hand, say they're aghast at the collapse of discipline in our schools. On the other hand, many people, often the same people, will say, you know, it, it's wrong to uh, expel a child too quickly. You've got to give children every opportunity. And so, first of all, there's not the short, sharp shock of the example to you of a child who's misbehaved being um, severely dealt with. But children are suspended again and again and again, rather than finally being expelled. And within their authorities, they will often then go to every single school, every single mainstream school, before finally they wind up in a school that is dedicated uh, for looking after those who simply cannot be disciplined. And, you, you know, that point. is a, part, a big part of the disruption in school. I think you make a good point. Uh, one of my viewers uh, says, uh, David says, Michelle, when you're talking about crime, one of the issues here is our judges that hand out very weak sentences. Well, the Justice Secretary, he's actually saying now we should have more open justice, so we should have more uh, publicly accessible uh, rulings where you, you can basically be involved, see what's going on with immigration uh, rulings and things like that. Would you support that or not? See you in two. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9 p.m. Has the NHS killed your relative and then lied to you about it? There is an alleged cover-up culture in the NHS. They lie to you about why your loved one died, about poor care, then bury documents with evidence in them, and they try to silence staff who speak out. This is according to the NHS Ombudsman. There are around 11,000 avoidable deaths every year. 11,000. Someone's mum dies, their children know something dodgy happened, and then they're met with a rotten culture, including the altering of care plans, the disappearance of crucial documents, and complete denials. They lie to you, but they really get away with it because the NHS is like a religion and people dare not criticise it. You'd be accused of nhs phobia. That annual budget is around £180 billion and we now have about 2 million people working for the NHS. They cannot keep blaming everything on being underfunded and understaffed. If they're covering up medical negligence, it means the problem doesn't get dealt with and it keeps happening. And that is the fault of the NHS managers, the people who run it, They've got the money for 837 non-clinical staff working at English hospitals on the highest paid Band 9 contracts, which is between £99,000 and £115,000 a year. How many nurses would that pay for? How many junior doctors? And they've got the time on their hands to think about making the NHS the world's first carbon-neutral health service. They've got time to consider whether women in labour should be picked up by an electric ambulance that might have to be recharged en route to the hospital. There are NHS managers with a budget of £180 billion, 2 million members of staff, and they're crying about being understaffed and under-resourced. If they spent more time looking after patients instead of finding ways to cover up avoidable deaths, then maybe we'd have a better health service. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hi there, Michelle Jubery alongside me. I've got uh, the candidate, Conservative candidate for Finchley and Golders Green, Alex Dean, and the director of the charity World Right, Kerry Dingle. Um, lots of people say, Michelle, the answer to many of these questions tonight is simple, a lack of discipline. And says, boundaries. That is what's going on. We have no more boundaries in society. And without boundaries, society breaks down, she says. I was talking about law and order. Uh, one of my viewers earlier, David, was talking about the judges 
is and the sentences that they dish out, or lack of, some people might argue. Well, anyway, now uh, plans are being considered by the Ministry of Justice so that actually the public and journalists could potentially get access to so-called secretive magistrates' hearings. This would be for stuff like non-payment of your TV licence, fines, whatever, but also perhaps like immigration cases. Alex? Yeah, or speeding courts. I prosecuted in speeding courts where um, you know the door is closed and the atmosphere is slightly more relaxed and uh, not that convictions are waived through exactly, but you can process many dozen cases in an hour in a way that in an open court um, going through a case with live evidence you, you never could. Um, I, I was in chambers briefly with the now Lord Chancellor. He's an excellent lawyer, much better than I ever was. Um, I think he's right to want this to happen. But of course, what he really means, it's not, it's not about things like the, the speeding fines or, or TV licenses, important though uh, that is. It's the really eye catching stuff like the immigration rules. Mm. And I think people should see the, the principle of open justice is very important to me, I think. And I, and I strongly support these um, reforms. So, yes from you, Kerry? Yes, they should absolutely be open. I, I'd say, you know, what, what is there to hide? And if it's just about process and speed, I don't think that's an excuse, given that there were half a million people convicted last year who didn't even enter a plea, you know, weren't even part of it, just happened behind their backs. And I do know people who've been wrongfully convicted. In well, there you go. Um, uh, would you support more open justice? It's a yes from these guys. Is it a yes from, uh, from you at home? And you talk about process and speed, which leads me nicely onto artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, what do you think to this? So many examples of it now. Uh, but now research has come out saying that up to 8 million jobs could be lost to AI. Should we be worried about this then, Alex, or not? AI will take some jobs and create opportunities elsewhere. And a big slant of the report that we've seen from the IPPR it, it suggests that people of more working class backgrounds stand to risk their jobs. Actually, I think that many um, artisanal and, and crafts based jobs are likely to survive for far longer. It's trainee lawyers who need to worry about their jobs, uh, pasting precedents and, and seeking out material. Those are the first jobs that are really going to be at risk, I think. Kerry? I think we should embrace AI. I think it's very, very exciting. And I think I, I, I think Alex is right. I think the IPPR is wrong. I think you know, a huge number of working class people will be the ones who write the AI programs. AI is not, mm. you know, some autonomous, scary sci-fi machine. These are written by us and created by us and will evolve new jobs and, and professions. And very excitingly, in terms of what it can offer medicine, the jobs it will lose are mostly your kind of, you know, data entry, data analysts, admin, boring research. And I've used AI in, in film and video. And the real problem is that so far it's not that advanced, actually. But one day it will be. If one it's a question of quality. It only will so, be. Yeah. It must certainly. I mean, potholes as well. There's been uh, robots developed as well now that can actually go and fix potholes. I mean, That'd be good. everyone, yeah, should be pleased about that, shouldn't they? Um, what's this? What's this robot we're showing you on the screen? Oh, this is apparently the pothole one. Oh, yes, there you go. Look, this is the pothole robot. Look at that. It looks like something that's been cobbled together by a five-year-old. Well, it, it looks like a prototype. Did you see it? it to be, let's be fair, Am it looks I like, a, it looks like a prototype. No, oh, okay. you, you, you are right, but I don't imagine the finished product will okay. look like that. Um, I shall refrain from uh, criticising modern technology because, let's face it, we could all do with the potholes uh, getting repaired, couldn't we? Are you excited and energised um, about AI? Um, who's this saying about checkout staff? Michael says, uh, what about checkout staff? At supermarket. I used to be a checkout girl, actually. Yes, self checkouts now. Um, many people are, do not like them. Uh, Sean says the internet, smartphones, social media, uh, they've had so many negative, unintended consequences. Speaking of negativity, I was going to try very quickly, but I don't think I've got time now to show you a statue uh, that's been erected of Prince Philip at Cambridge. Can I bring it up quickly or not? Look at this. People are up in arms about it. Can you see that? Do you think that's a good statue? Apparently, it's been branded the worst ever Prince Philip statue. It's not very good, but we put worse things on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square every year. So. This is very, very true, actually. Yes, we do. Kerry, are you an art lover? I am an art lover, I, and I like abstract art. I just I wouldn't know anything to do How with Prince How are you supposed Philip. to know that's Prince Philip? Exactly, oh. I wouldn't. I, you know, abstract art is great, but don't call it Prince Philip, then. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. Perhaps we're just not sophisticated enough to be able to appreciate it. Uh, look, that's all we've got time for. Kerry, thank you for your company. Alex, thank you for yours, too. And very importantly, thank you for yours. Don't go anywhere. Nigel Farage is up next. From me, Nanite. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar.
and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There will still be some showers around this weekend, but generally through the Easter period, it is going to be a bit drier and a bit warmer than it has been of late. Low pressure still in control like it has been through much of this week, but the flow around the low is going to ease a little bit, so we will see our winds easing. That being said, through the end of today, still quite blustery for many of us, some heavy showery rain affecting northern areas, something a little bit drier and clearer across central parts and also Northern Ireland. Here under the clear skies could see a touch of frost and perhaps even a few pockets of mist and fog. Elsewhere where we stick with the cloud and the showery rain, it is going to be a milder start to Good Friday. Otherwise, and as we go through Good Friday itself, yes, a bit of brightness and some dry weather around at first, but still outbreaks of showery rain and a greater chance of catching some showers as we go into the afternoon. Potential for some showers turning heavy, possibly even thundery with some hail. But there should be some bright sunny spells in between the showers and temperatures higher than recently, highs of around 14 Celsius towards the southeast. The winds will be easing and easing further as we go into Saturday, which does look like it will be a calmer and drier day than of late for many. Still some showers around, but they don't look quite as intense as we've seen recently, though potential for some heavy rain to affect parts of Cornwall later on in the day. Easter day itself on Sunday looks mostly dry. There are a few showers still, but turning cooler again by Monday. See you later. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good evening, my name is Johnny Ratner. Big problems if you're heading west of Nottingham this evening on the A52. The westbound carriageway is closed along Brian Clough Way from Bardeals Island south of Staplefoot through to the junction of the M1. That's the scene of an accident causing lengthy queues as you head out of the city centre that start before Bramcut Island. Meanwhile in Wiltshire, the A303 has closed both ways through Chicklate because of flooding and in Dorset, west of Dorchester, the westbound carriageway of the A35 shut near to Kingston Russell where a caravan has overturned. Um, the M48 Seven Bridge, they're still closed both ways, heading between England and Wales because of the strong winds. Long queues as you divert on the M4 over the Prince of Wales Bridge and on the M49 and the M5 northwest of Bristol. And in Carmarthenshire and Newcastle, Emlyn, Emlyn 